Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, Happy New Year. I hope you all had a really good Christmas and feel thoroughly rested. So, welcome to today's meeting. Full details of questions submitted and the Mayor's written replies have been circulated. They are on the Council's website and also being displayed on the screen as we work through them. Groups have submitted their questions in priority order and I will, as usual, take supplementary questions on a rotating basis. Each councillor can ask a maximum of two supplementary questions. Due to Thursday's by-election in Brislington East, the council remains subject to the pre-election protocol. I expect everyone to act appropriately and any attempts to electioneer will not be tolerated. We firstly move on to Labour question one, Councillor Jackson, planning. Thank you, Lord Mayor. <coughs> I have two supplementaries, um, one to the first one. Um, thanks for your reply, uh, Marvin. I've called this application in to go to committee and look forward to reiterating the points I've already made, but this covenant was issued to the landowner of 149 Marksby Road, <coughs> and he was told that he couldn't build on it. Now, this has been going on for three years. Is there anything the council can do to uphold the covenant before this goes to planning? I'll t uh, you mean, I'm, I'm understand. Right. So I've been told we're going to need to rely on the planning process, but let me go back and, and and find out and exhaust all possibilities uh, with, yeah, and get some legal advice on that as well. Yeah, we'll get back to you on that, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. And supplementary to my second question, and again, thank you for your reply. I don't know if Paul can uh, spread some light on this, but on the Philwood Cinema site, um, what future local public engagement are you going to allow us to have on that one specific site within Philwood? Well, let me let Paul take that one then, uh, Chris. Thank you. Okay, um, thank, thank you, Chris, for the, for the question. Uh, before Christmas, I met with the representatives of the Noel West Alliance and yourself. You. Um, and what it was agreed to do as a result of that meeting was to delay the development of the Philwood Cinema site because of its importance, because of the need to regenerate Philwood Broadway to go back to consultation with the Noel West Alliance and the community to make sure that the commercial uses um, on that site actually match what might be available and what people might want in, in that area. Um, so because of, because of that, yes, there'll be a delay in, de in the development, but hopefully we'll get something that local people are fully behind. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to Conservative question one. Councillor Weston, vandalism in Blaise Castle Estate. Do you have a supplementary? I do, my Lord Mayor. And first of all, can I say that I'm absolutely aghast. The Mayor has given a response for which I can't really find any fault with. Um, uh, uh, is he well? Um, just, no, thank you very much. I genuinely am happy with this. Can I just ask two supplementaries? Um, the first one, the CCTV itself obviously is needed because there's been an awful lot of vandalism in the area. Can you give me some assurance that that vandalism will be repaired and possibly take this away and provide me with a time scale in due course? Yeah, I mean, in, in the answers, I, we actually went back and asked people to become very more specific with the time scales we're talking about, not a period of time. And uh, hence, you've got the dates in there now that um, hopefully won't come back to bite us, but we've asked for certainty on, you know, um, on those dates. But yeah, we'll. Um, you know, the, the, the team will be working to correct those parts. I use the part myself with my kids, so I know, you know, how important it is. Um, and yeah, we'll, and we'll make sure that we work with you on that. Second supplementary in relation to the damage to the play area, and I appreciate uh, we fully completed 17th of April. Uh, may I ask if you would be willing to possibly use your uh, auspices of authority to try and bring that forward? That actually is the middle, or if not the end, of the Easter holidays. Be lovely to have the player up and running for the Easter holidays themselves, and if possible, could you see if there's any flexibility on that time frame? Happy, happy to push it. Um, as I said, we 
we had a period of time offered to us, and then we asked for a specific date so we could have some certainty in there. But um, I'm, you know, be happy to ask the guys to see if we could possibly do any further forward. Thank you. Green, question one, Stephen Clark, Airport, Bristol Airport. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, thanks very much for your answer. And I'm pleased you recognise that uh, Bristol is a statutory c c council T and therefore um, an important voice. Um, I've read the letter of support for this application that he refers to in his, his comment. I mean, a lot's changed since April. Um, not least what's happening in Australia at the moment. Um, the decision on this application is due to be made within the next month. I'd like to give him this opportunity to please change his mind, to withdraw his support and to put in a letter of objection. So the question is, will he put in a letter of objection to this application? No, Stephen, we, we've said many times this is a a decision, a quasi-judicial decision for uh, North Somerset. The letter was simply a factual response to a planned application around changes to roadworks, uh, uh, to changes to the roundabout um, and parking. It recognises the role of the of the airport, which it has a role. It's not, it is there. Um, it's an employer. It recognises the numbers, recognises the uh, the aspirations that airport has uh, for itself. Uh, we raise the issues in there around the impact of the airport on uh, congestion um, for, for the area, and we raise concerns around the impact that um, air flights um, has on our, on our, on our climate uh, goals. And what we do is we say we want to work with the airport, as you'd expect us to do, um, in the future. So, you know, there's a little bit of misrepresentation about what this, this letter actually is. It's a very factual response to, to a, a plan application uh, that's gone in. Um, and deals with numbers as they are. Well, perhaps I've misunderstood the situation. It says the council supports the important role that Bristol Airport plays. So can I just ask him now then in my second supplementary, whether he supports the application that Bristol Airport have made to expand their, passengers, their passenger numbers? It's kind of a, a binary question, yes or no, please. I think you do, I do. I do think you have misunderstood uh, the the letter because I've got it right in front of me. In front of me, right here, what it says is, "Thank you for the opportunity to comment um, on the airport. We support the important role the airport plays in connecting the west of England um, and the wider southwest to global destinations, and we do. That global connectivity that, that bears no." Uh, that, that doesn't relate to the airport's um, aspirations. It's just about recognising that that's a vital part of the attractiveness of this part of the world and a part of our credibility, the same way um, as the port is. So I think you did misunderstand the letter, and it's worth uh, going back and uh, reading it um, again. But what's so the hang answer on, to... Hang on, you've had your two supplementaries. No, no I haven't had the answer no, you to my question. you've had your two supplementaries, I, I've I'm not afraid. had the answer to my question. You, yeah, but you've had two supplementaries. I'm, I'm afraid that the Mayor has responded, and that is his response. So you've had well, your two supplementaries. He, he hasn't responded well, to my uh, question. Yeah, I know you may, not, you may not be satisfied with the response, but you've had... You've had two supplementaries and you've had two responses. So he so refuses thank you, to respond. Thank you very thank much. You. We need to move on. Thank you. Um, Lib Dem question one, Councillor Negus, a bus service to Cotton Ward. Do you have a supplementary? Yes, I do, Lord Mayor. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the uh, problems that we've got uh, working in this very strange system with a private company um, running the most important part of our transport network in this city, which we're trying to move forward. Um, could I ask the Mayor if he's considered using the options available to him under the clean air zone under the, um, and under the franchising options that are available, and in fact other existing uh, legislation opportunities that we have in this city in order to change this system so that we can have a bus service that operates for our people. Because I have to tell my constituents the only way to get their bus service back again is to change the system. What are you prepared to do about that? Uh, we've considered all the options available to us because this is a challenge uh, we have to take on, but then the options have to be deliverable, affordable, and actually deliver the change that uh, uh, people are promising. And, uh, and th that's the, uh, the bottom line of it. Uh, we would love system change around public transport. I'm giving a talk in a couple of weeks up in uh, the launch of the Centre for Cities uh, new State of the Cities report. 
Um, in fact, we've been invited because, as they say in their invitation, we are a leading uh, national city on clean air uh, for, what we, for what we're doing here. And I'll be making the point about the kind of system change we need around the way public transport is is running this country that allows us as cities to actually not be on the receiving end of decisions, but actually taking the decisions about the way transport works in our, within our boundaries. Thanks. I welcome the talk. I'd like some action. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Labour question two. Councillor Hickman, Bristol's Democracy. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for your response, Marvin, which will be reassuring to councillors from all parties and the public. Bristol is rightly concerned about voter intimidation and abuse of elected public servants. Given widespread and concerning rumours alleging that his election agent was the person removed from polling stations in Bristol North West, would the mayor encourage the leader of the opposition to now clarify any relationship between his campaign and these events? Um, I, I mean, I'd encourage anyone to clarify the relationships with people who are you know, active in politics. Um, I think that's the same way as I'd offer a question to Chris. That's a question for Mark you might want to take here or, or outside. So. Do you have a second supplementary? Thank you. Um, we move to Conservative question, second question, which is Councillor Eddy, provision of advisory, no parking lines. Can I thank the Mayor for his reply? Uh, however, I would point out that actually white lines can be used for multiple reasons. For example, in Atlans, we use them, we have painted them on key road junctions to combat problem commuter car parking, and it seems to work. In this context, certainly not agree there might be an option for their use. Yeah, I mean, the feedback I had was that, um, that they weren't, they haven't been working as, as effectively as we might, that the, the real solution would be to actually request double uh, yellow lines, but as we've committed on parking, we recognise this is a challenge um, across the city, and uh, we want to take an approach that work with local councillors to solve the challenges in their patch. So I'd be more than happy for Kai to, to meet with you to talk specifically about what, what would work in your patch. It does have to fit within a broader um, city approach, but more than happy to facilitate. Is that, is that okay, Kai? Could you meet with Councillor Eddy? Thanks. Do you have a second supplementary? Thank you very much. We move on to green question two, Councillor Rourke scrutiny. Do you have a supplementary? Um, thank you for the answer. Um, I'm still slightly confused. Just can I probe the, the answer that I've got a bit, and then I do have a supplementary. Um, so you say that now that we have more information on the disposal of Temple Island site, we will be ringing a further scrutiny briefing again to enhance transparency. But that's what we asked for last week. We, we, you know the 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 Constitution says that if scrutiny wants to see documents, and the documents are there, that we should be able to see them. And we weren't able to see them. And, and I think that that was a mistake. Um, but so, so I, don't, I don't know what that means, because we were told after the Cabinet decision in July that when more documents were available, we would be able to see them. We put it on the forward plan, we scheduled the meeting, and then we weren't able to see them. So you know, it's a bit of a council of despair on that. Um, and, and in part of your answer, so this is my supplementary question, in part of your answer you say that um, the Cabinet report is available for the public to also scrutinise, um, but the Cabinet report for Temple Island hasn't been published. Um, the questions from the public is closing tomorrow afternoon and the document yet again has not been published. So, um, and the exempt items which are due to come to scrutiny have not been published. So the question is, you know, What's the story? When, is, when, when, when are people going to be able to actually see something about this, to ask questions and comment? So um, there were two, there were two um, elements to your question, because it was quite broad and then obviously specific around um, Temple Island. I mean, first of all, um, the, the, you know, the report, the, we're still waiting for some information for the report. And there's a meeting after here, and um, it will be made available, and obviously it will be made available um, in time for Cabinet as well. I think what's also, as often happens, we've got two, two levels of um, conversation going on in here. One is the specific and then a, um, and a, the council of despair that you talk about, um, you know, a, a drive to, to build this current narrative that, um, 
that I am, as I think there have been three charges against me, one being like Putin, the other being like a North Korean leader, and I've even had the picture of me next to Trump, kind of undermining democracy on a, on a grand scale. Um, what we did do in the first, uh, in the written response is to show you that um, that's far from the case, that actually we've been working uh, with anyone who wants to get real stuff done in the organization and working with the whole city. And actually the contrast between what happens in this chamber and last Friday when we had 250 people from right across the city contributing to write in a single city plan with six thematic boards taking collective responsibility of what we want to get done in Bristol is a, is a real uh, symbol of genuine inclusive uh, leadership that's accountable uh, to, to the city and opening up leadership and decision making. So on the, uh, on the Temple Island report, that will be with you when the information comes in, but on the, the kind of the subtle but blatant attempt to suggest about undermining democracy, I, don't, I think that's far from the way we're actually running Bristol. Do you have a second supplementary? Um, well, I mean, I just go to the point that everybody, members are just really interested in, members are just really keen to, to scrutinise and see this, as was evident at the scrutiny meeting last week. And, you know, I don't know when the report is actually going to be published, but it isn't enough time to give the public, and I, I'm getting emails from members of the public saying, we weren't able to look at this document and we want to know what's happening and we want to be able to put questions in. Unless, you know, again, we, we delay, the, the postpone the time if we ask democratic services, that people get some, all I really want is for the public and members to be able to look at these documents, scrutinize them properly, and make themselves certain that everything is fine. So is that a question? Yeah, well, the question is, when are we going to see the document? It's, you know, the, the questions close at four o'clock tomorrow. Nobody can see these documents yet. So will, will the situation be reviewed later today um, about where those documents are at in terms of completing them and then we will be able to uh, share that. But can I, for the sake of a, a political conversation and self-awareness uh, within the City Council, I do think that uh, there are members of the public that want to read the documents that are circulated around this, uh, this um, local authority. But I think there are also lots of members of the public that just want us to get stuff done they want us to build homes, uh, they want us to deliver clean air, solve the transport uh, solution, deliver on a channel four delivery, uh, keep the children's centres open and get real stuff done. So that I, I'm not, and don't misinterpret this, this is not to say that the, 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 you know, the paperwork isn't important, but there are lots of people who want us to deliver and historically this organisation is not one that's delivered. So let's, let's you know, keep keep uh, some of that uh, stuff in balance and not think that our questions in our world is the, is the whole question in the whole world for everyone in Bristol. Thank you. Uh, Lib Dem question two, Councillor Kent, education, health care plans. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, I do, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you very much for your answer, Mr Mayor. Um, it's a shame the Council don't seem to know uh, how many times we've been taken to court in the last nine months. Uh, my first supplementary then is... Uh, with um, concession and a loss rate of 90%, do you think that the pain, uh, the expense, and the time lost for children unable to access necessary provision is worth it to have won just 16 cases over the past five years? I think you know, we're doing everything we can. I'm going to hand over to Anna. Um, in a Let me hand over to you now, actually, Anna, and I'll come back after you. Um, Tim, as you know, you know I, I, I agree with you. There's been, and I've said this publicly many times, there's been far too much pain for too many families. And I know that you've personally experienced some of that and had some of your sort of passion around this, which I appreciate. Um, yes, it isn't. It, of course, it's not OK. We don't want a situation where nobody is able to appeal. They've, obviously, people should always have the right to do that. We obviously, one of the key indicators that we continue to look at is we should see those, those appeals declining. The reality is that sometimes parents um, will disagree with some of the reports that come back. I've been in a situation as a teacher where I've disagreed with some of the reports that, that have come back and we have to sometimes have to spend time finding a way forward on that. Um, it is part of, um, you'll all know, our written statement of action. It is also part of doing a good job for SEND that we have much better um, building of bridges with parents and carers. Um, some of that will show, I would hope, in terms of the number of appeals that come forward and the number of complaints that come forward. But, um, you know, most importantly, obviously, is to keep the children at the centre of it and to be doing that regardless of the number of people that want to appeal or 
send complaints to us. We, we need to be engaging and actually growing um, many of the processes coming through so that we're not in a position where people um, feel so aggrieved at the, end of the, at the end of the process. And as you know, a key thing for us is the length of time people are having to wait for various processes throughout the system, which has been well documented. Do you I've got have a second, second supplementary? supplementary? Yeah. yeah, okay. Thank you for the answer. Um, I want to address the cost side because, of course, it seems quite low, eight or nine thousand uh, pounds. I was surprised, though, to read that the answer doesn't include the internal officer time that's spent to, uh, and they, they couldn't calculate this. Because in the July Schools Forum paper, Resource Planning for SEND Function, uh, Appendix 3, page 85 of the document pack, it actually does just that. So it actually breaks down the costs of EPs, fighting appeals. Uh, when you actually look through that document and you calculate back, you find that somewhere in the region of 500 working days of educational psychologist time have been fought fighting appeals that the council's nearly always lost. So that's 500 work days we've lost of educational psychologists, one of our, our most valuable resources. That's about a quarter of a million pounds. I've not included, of course, the cost for the solicitors, the cost for the caseworkers, the cost of head teachers and SENCOs appearing, of course, all to be on the losing side. Do we think that was a good use of resources? No, I don't think it's good use of resources, and I don't think it's good use of anyone's time either. You know that um, I have never said anything other than it has not been good enough, the way SEND has been dealt with. It, the offset inspector said since 2013, okay, so this is so we've all in this room share some responsibility for that. Um, it is, um, it's not, it's not, it's not acceptable in terms of a money point of view, but, but Again, there's also the other thing that you can't put a price on is that, you know, the time and money that costs families that are having to appear, as you know. So that's also um, an important question. I don't think you particularly asked that one, but to um, ultimately, you know, the council has got money that's been able to spend on that, but it's not the right place to spend it. You're correct. And it is, um, and it's, yeah, it's not acceptable that that, that, um, that for families that to have to go through that and to actually, you know, take time off work themselves and see issues with that. Um, as we have said, as it is detailed, and you will see more of as the um, detail of our SEND transformation plan comes forward, which is being consulted on with parents and carers at every stage. It's a legal requirement, but we were doing that before anyway, and we will continue to do so. Um, you will see that um, the parent voice is critical, and carer voice and child's voice is critical throughout that. And the use of, again, you should should see one of the key indicators which will continually be brought through scrutiny which you'll see there as well um we'll be looking at those the, those costs and particularly at use of officer time thank you i mean i'd say i mean there's always going to be a case where there's going to be disagreement and there will be appeals we don't take uh, take away from where it hasn't uh, done well but there has to be an element of that within the system we, you know people will be making judgments i mean i i just finish off by for me which is an important piece of context to this i mean you might say i would say that wouldn't i but yeah i will um we've been uh, brutally frank about the challenge um and the the failures within um, uh, the send offer in in bristol um and i think it's right to do so the importance the the real issue here is what's going on for the children um, and, and their families and and focusing on putting that right and, and anna has done that taking it on full frontal and uh, and you know, and, uh, and and driven. And since she's take, since she's uh, come into post, she picked this up as soon as she came in, and has uh, uh, really begin to focus on it. But but the I, I think sometimes I think it's a little bit unfortunate. I don't necessarily suggest it's intentional. Um, I don't know, but to to draw from that a broader kind of suggestion that we don't care about what's going on for young people um, in the city is is not fair. Um, when you think about the things that we are doing that actually support SEND children, um, a, as well as all children, such as keeping our children's centres open despite the three billion pound national funding gap, uh, we've done that. The work experience placements for young people, particularly those who are furthest from the markets or don't have aunts and uncles working in the big industries in Bristol, uh, least likely to get it. The, the children's charter that Helen um, uh, Godwin, uh, you know, has really led on, along with the, the work around uh, period uh, poverty, the bringing through three new schools, 
uh, uh, 60,000 meals uh, last summer to hungry children um, in Bristol. Um, you know, the work we've done uh, recruiting foster families um, and celebrating kids in care. And just on, on Saturday, we were uh, um, um, a, a pantomime um, that, that again came from conversations between Helen and the workforce, council tax exemption for kids leaving care up to the age of 25, the cascade mental health training in primary schools. There's a lot going on that, that shows that actually we have taken seriously that marmot challenge from 2010, which is one about making Bristol a city in which every child gets off to the best possible start in life, irrespective of their uh, of the circumstances um, of their birth. We away take nothing away from the, shit, the, the scale of the challenge facing us in SEND, but it does fit within the context in which we really have worked hard to prioritise the needs of, of our children and young people. Thank you. Uh, we come to Labour question three, Councillor Alexander Holmes. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yes, um, my, my question was about the building of the very welcome building of council houses in Lawrence Western. Uh, my first supplementary is regarding the Public Word Works Loans Board, um, which is the mechanism by which central government lends money to local authorities for projects such as this. Uh, central government has recently increased the rate of interest by 1%. Uh, would the Mayor like to comment on the effect of that on our, our ability to build houses here in the city for uh, our most vulnerable people? Well, anything that makes money and more expensive for us is not totally welcome. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we've, um, and again, it's one of the points that we make into government, we want financial certainty, bankable partnership from national governments um, to be able to bring forward the physical development of the city that depends on that billion of pounds uh, moving around our, our, our economy and our access to access to the loans, the grants and the investment um, that we want. Paul, I don't want to catch you on the hot, Paul. Is this something you'd like to, to comment on as well? Yeah, it's on the hot. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you what, you can talk to Don afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Alexander, do you have a second supplementary? I do, yes. Thank you. Um, it's regarding the um, government's plan in 2015 to build 200,000 starter homes. I wonder how many we expect to see of those in my ward. Can you name your ward? I, yeah, uh, yeah, Avonmouth and Lawrence yeah, Western, but I think in any ward it would be the same answer. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I'm just being confirmed. Just wanted to double check that. Um, none, I think, is the answer. Um, house building is being done by us at the moment. Paul? I mean, we, we did prepare a bid um, for the Start Home Initiative in 2016. It's one of the first things I, I had to sign off. Um, we didn't think that it was a particularly useful scheme, but then it would allow us access to additional money, particularly for land purchase. We were looking at sites that have been stored, particularly a large one um, in fish ponds. Um, and although we got through that funding system, um, the Theresa May's government uh, quite rightly, basically slowly and quietly closed that funding scheme. So I'm not unhappy uh, with that. Thank you. Uh, we move now to Conservative question three, Councillor Glandris, Freeport. Do you have a supplementary? Uh, thank you, my Lord Mayor. Um, and Marvin, thank you for the answers, which are, are very helpful. Just a small supplementary on your second answer. There are clearly lots and lots of issues with Freeport. It's a new sort of area uh, for us. Would you agree that it's important for Bristol City Council to be at the negotiating table, to take an active and key role in any negotiations to show what the Freeport looks like? Absolutely. Um, you know, if it comes through, yeah, um, and obviously, as we've said to you in the answer, we won't make a blanket commitment. We need to see what it means. Um, and uh, again, part of the piece around this being important for regeneration and tackling deprivation and the economically left behind, uh, the free port may or may not make a contribution to that, but there are other areas I'd love to work with you on, talking to national government about getting proper funding for our services and helping us build homes and get a viable investment for our transport uh, system that, that we think will, will be much 
would give us much more immediate return on, on tackling um, inequalities. Um, but yeah, whatever goes on, we'll, we'll need to be at the table. And I've, I think, um, if, if I can say, actually through the city office and the, the thematic boards we've set up, we've done that job of bringing city partners together for those, um, those, those, those bigger, bigger city goals that we're trying to meet. Do you have a second supplementary? Okay, thank you very much. We'll move on to green question three. Councillor Comley, air quality. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you, just one. Uh, just quickly, can I take that as a yes, that you will not allow either the standards or the time scales to slip, even if the pressure is lifted off by central government? Yeah, I mean, we're Thanks. not, I, I, as I, I think, obviously justifying the question, uh, look, we, what we said was, the only thing that's changed is government focus. Uh, we were already driving in on how we deliver, how we get to clean air. And I've shared a number of times, just to bring a bit of a reality check on how hard it is to work with government, that before it was a headline issue, I was up in City Hall in London with Sadiq Khan, Andy Burnham, Andy Street from the Midlands, and uh, Michael Goat with, with the UK 100, Michael Gove asked to attend the meeting, and we all, cross party, said to national government that we clean air is an issue for all of us, but we need two things. We need another billion and a half pound in the clean air fund for the mitigations, and we want support for a diesel uh, transition scheme to get people away from diesel. Um, and again, there weren't headlines at the time, but Michael Gove said, you can't have that. So we said, well, it makes it much harder for us to, to deliver cities that have uh, the need to deliver clean air, but also have the need to support businesses to tackle inequality, uh, you know, and, and, and the many thousand other um, challenges um, that we have to take on. So this is just a continuation of work. It's, it's, you know, it's much of a much, really. Can I ask, do you have a second supplementary? No, that's fine. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We move on to Lib Dem question three, Councillor Negus, um, airport expansion. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, my second supplementary um, relates to the answer you gave to uh, Councillor Clark about our response, or your response rather, uh, on, the, on the Bristol Airport expansion. You, you, I'm afraid you, you patronise us regularly, and you did in these answers to both of us when you tell us that, that the, the limitations on your uh, ability to do anything on this. I'm simply focusing on your responsibilities as a consultee to actually make the point. If I may teach you equally to suck eggs, I will say that your response as, and I tried to find it on the Law Somerset um, uh, website, they've only got one on parking uh, from Bristol, nothing else. Um, if I may ask you, why is it that you are concentrating on the airport as it is, rather than the planning application, which is quite definitely about airport expansion? Why are you not answering that question as put to you, but instead dodging the issue by talking about the airport as it is. And you seem to be quite proud of that answer. I'm concerned about it. It doesn't reflect the way I think a lot of people in Bristol feel about this. Thank you. I, I think, I always think, um, I don't know how you um, kind of make the assessments. I think it's a big thing to suggest what you think I'm feeling um, uh, and so forth. So I, I wouldn't necessarily go there myself. So I'm not really a, a fan of that, Councillor Negus. But um, the point is, we were asked to comment on the, the application. The application is about the, the roundabout and parking and, and just to make some factual, and we responded quite factually and um, blankly to it. I, what I have said is, and, and there is some mischief around the, the, the relationship of my, you know, uh, uh, my view. I'm not actively supporting anything. What I've done is if I'm asked, I've, you know, I've, I've shared a number of questions that I think need to be answered around uh, around the airport itself but this is just a factual response and you've been a councillor for an incredibly long time in Bristol um, and I'm sure that um, you are, are would be more than able to explain to uh, the city just how much purchase you have had in that time over decisions made in uh, North Somerset planning committees if you've got evidence of having a great deal of influence over them then you know it'd be great to see that evidence and see how we do it do you have a second supplementary? Thank you very much. We move to Labour question four, Councillor Massey, bus services. 
Duncan. Thank you for your answer to the question. But with the projected new build taking place on the field and airfield site, the traffic congestion quoted by First Bus is only going to worsen. So can we be assured that traffic officers will be reviewing the double mini roundabout again with a view to possibly installing traffic lights there or other options to speed up the traffic flow? Because this is being quoted by First as the reason for the very challenging decision to remove the 76 bus stops at the junction of Penn Park Road, Monks Park Avenue and Southmead Road. The northern B4056 road no longer has any public transport to the city centre. And whilst we don't object to the bus going in and out of Southmead Hospital, there's absolutely no reason why it couldn't be rerouted down there and around the mini roundabouts again. It, currently, this now means that a lot of elderly and disabled people living in that area have to walk up a very steep hill to get up to either the in inside Southmead Hospital or up to the main road. And that is, ca is causing an awful lot of problems for people. What's your question? Um, so, um, with, um, it's just on the, uh, the front point when you talk about the developments up there, I mean, it, it, we have been very clear that adequate transport, and Darren Jones has as well, um, that, um, that transport has to be taken seriously, and it is. It's being put front and centre with Metro Bus and new train station, park and ride uh, uh, that we're bringing through as, as well. Um, and we will work closely with South Gloucestershire um, on those cross-border transport issues, because obviously we know that uh, we, we can't do anything alone. Um, the council itself doesn't actually have a policy around the distance for bus stops, but we understand that Transport for London uh, do have some guidelines um, so we will uh, look at how we can uh, uh, talk to uh, First Bus and, and, and the operators and, um, and South Gloucestershire and bring those into play in Bristol if they, if they would prove to be um, advantageous to, to the city. Do you have a second supplementary? Just to follow up, can we be assured that the double mini roundabout will be looked at in future because it's been a cause of concern for some time? Kai, do you want to come in on this one? Yeah, uh, thanks for that, um, Marvin. Brent. Uh, so, um, double the double mini roundabout is obviously yeah, clearly a problem. It creates a lot of congestion. Um, I did ask the question at the time of the A four one A four one zero eight proposals. Um, given that a large number of the proposals didn't go forward, that there would be some budget available to deal with that issue. And I was assured by officers that in the medium term, that is part of the plan to deal with that issue anyway, from um, other budget streams. So. Um, after this meeting, I'll go away and get a, a, a time frame for you on when they expect to deal with that issue, if you're happy with that. I'm not happy, but thank you for trying. <laughs> thank you. We'll move on to Conservative question four, Councillor Malias. Um, giant Gorham site sale. Yeah, um, no supplementaries. Just thank you for your answers, and I'll continue my challenge with the development management team, basically. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, green question for Councillor Hans Send. Hello. I doubt, I doubt very much I'll be able to answer this straight away, so just do it in writing later on. Um, I took my maths O-level some time ago, but judging from what you said, there were 28 tribunal report appeals, and we've got the results of eight of them, so if you could let me know what happened to the other 20, that'd be great. And Echoing what Councillor Kemp was saying, um, what were the legal costs of all of this? Because I know that the legal implications for some families in my ward have been pretty catastrophic. So I'd be interested to know how much the local authorities spent on this. But like I said, I'm not expecting the answer right now because it's a figure. Yeah, so there was, a, I think some of yours overlaps a little bit with what um, Councillor Kent said. If there's bits that you want following up or clarification like Tim did on that, then let's feel free to pass that my way. I'll get an officer to come back to you on it. Thank you very much. We'll move on to Conservative Question 5, Councillor Morris, the fallout from the SEND inspection report. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you, my Lord Mayor. No supplementaries, and thank you for the answer. Thank you very much. Green Question 5, Councillor Stephen, street flooding, MEES. Do you have any supplementaries? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, so on the uh, street flooding, um, we have lots of trees in Bristol. We want to have more. Every autumn, those trees drop their leaves and they tend to block the same drains year on year. And that's a danger to cyclists. 
Um, so although uh, you've described one of the systems we have for uh, management of drains, does the council know which drains are the ones that are blocked each year, year on year, as the water floods down? And if so, does it have a plan of, uh, to unblock those drains before the flooding? Yeah, I mean, after test what they got, well, I would suspect that there would be accumulated knowledge over the time about where the particular flooding spots are, and then there is a need to make sure that um, the systems are in place to address them. I think there was some, there was a bit of a pump issue that went on, unforeseen pumping issue recently. It's not just about um, uh, leaves blocking drains, but about some of the system that needed to uh, to be uh, replaced. But yeah, I'd expect them to know and. Um, we can just make sure they do. Do you have a second supplementary? Yes, so, so thank you for that. We'll follow that up. Um, the second one is about the uh, minimum energy um, enforcement schemes and specifically for commercial properties. Uh, you say a report is being drafted um, for submission to the BEIS, uh, Department for Business. Uh, would it be possible to see that report, please? I, I don't see why not. Unless there's anything particularly sensitive in it, commercially, legally, then, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Conservative Question 6, Councillor Alexander, SEND Services. Thank you very much for your replies. Just one question. Um, in number two... Third uh, second paragraph, you're working with schools to identify further resources to continue improvements. Does that mean, one, you're going to give it to them, two, oh. Do you need a moment? Um Can you read it? One, give the money. Two, expect the school to find this their own pot. Three, expect it to be found from their already tight budget. And four, any other way. Okay, I'll, so Anne is going to come in. Directly. I'll answer if that's right. Thank you for your, for, um, both of you for your questions. Um, it's, um, so I think the question as I read it and the response we've prepared was particularly to do with project Rainbow, um, which, if people aren't aware of, is a really impressive um, initiative run partly by the council and partly by City of Bristol College, and it's a it's an independent living um, facility for young people with a, um, additional learning needs. Amazing young people living there who um, have delivered some you know, brilliant work for the city in doing things like training other young people to use buses um, who have found that challenging and so on. Um, a really good place I encourage counters to visit if you haven't been there already. We're in um, year four of a five year project there. We would with adequate government funding have places like that right across Bristol because I know what it is like for parents to worry about your children when they reach the sort of 16 to 25 age and beyond that. Um, and if your child has additional needs and worrying about where they might be living and the support they might need is absolutely on your mind all the time. Um, so our MPs have, have our Labour MPs in Bristol have recently um, spoken in Parliament, as you'll be aware about the need for increased SEND funding, and we would appreciate your group's support in that and speaking to your government about that. Um, it is, um, when we're talking about the sort of wording of that, about the council and schools working to identify further resources, um, you know, schools have nominal budgets for SEND. They also can apply for top-up funding and, and, and other forms of funding. No, there isn't much money around. We are seeing cuts nationally everywhere, as you will all be aware. Um, we will, we do ask that money is well spent by schools and that schools are being inc as inclusive as um, possible. I think this question was more about capital funding and though we would not expect schools, to answer your question, we would not expect schools to find that um, funding for additional SEN support themselves. That's funded either directly from government or would be through our capital spend budget, which we've had a cabinet paper about not that long ago. You might want to look back into July uh, about sort of, uh, special schools funding. But do come back to me if you wanted to ask anything else at another time, Leslie. I mean, beyond that, I'd say, Councillor Alexander, you know, our, 
our approach would be to work with the schools to, to find the additional resource and, and we want to support them and advantage them one of the issues raised recently was around kids being excluded you know we do, we don't want to go and lift the burden and put them on their shoulders and expect them to carry it we want to say right here's a city challenge that we have how can we work with you to get the necessary resource spent in the right places at the right time to to meet that challenge and that that will shape our approach to them Thank you. We move on to Green at question six. Councillor Denier, Mayors for Peace. Do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, thank you for the response. Uh, but in it, you told me that you support the UN's non-proliferation of nuclear weapons treaty, uh, signed up to by 191 states. OK, but my question was asking if you would make a public statement in support of the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons rather than the non-proliferation. They're separate treaties. And the one I asked about was a, is a stronger one that would abolish nuclear weapons, whereas the non-proliferation one, as the name suggests, would just seek to prevent further spread. As of um, November last year, 34 states have ratified the prohibition one. So please, could you answer that question that I asked about the treaty? Uh, it would be great to um, be able to have you announce it during the Mayors for Peace exhibition. But I understand if you don't have enough information to make a commitment right now, that's fine. A written answer is is, is Fine. There is a context. We're always wary with declarations and statements that that are you know because you get so many you get so many goes at making grand uh, gestures. We're doing this with the global parliament and mayors. Uh, we're very wary about what we say on the public stage and, and when we say it because people are saying, "Well, you're always talking. You're always making declarations." Uh, it's got no basis on on your policy. It's got no realistic chances of coming through. So we're you know we we. Uh, we want to use our voice on these kind of issues um, carefully. Um, what I am interested in in the in the piece is about is actually the very question of peace, mayors for peace, because actually we also I would say on this, and I think there is a wider conversation. It's not captured in the ability of this chamber to have meaningful political uh, discussion. It'd have to be something outside, but. You know, we, 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 have, we have been on the forefront of actually uh, working with other cities to create the conditions for more peace, uh, where, where conflict is less likely. David um, Donoghue, Ambassador David Donoghue, was here on Friday at the city gathering, uh, who negotiated the good, one of the negotiators of the Good Friday Agreement, was the founder, one of the two uh, UN ambassadors who founded the Global Sustainable Development Goals. And he talked about Bristol's role on migration and climate change and how we are actually, the, the voluntary local review we've done on the SDGs being a model for cities all over the world uh, to take on. And actually it is being taken on as a model in Los Angeles and London uh, now. So th there is that, I don't, I don't wanna go around, you know, just f throwing out decorations here, there and the other. It's gotta be based on substance. But actually, the wider work of peace and creating the conditions in which conflict is as likely is something that we're on the forefront of. Do you have a second supplementary? Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, so all of that is noted and, and, and yes, um, largely agreed. Um, but just to clarify then, so even though we're a member of Mayors for Peace and Mayors for Peace main focus for the last few years and the next few years is the prohibition of nuclear weapons, is that a no from you to supporting that campaign? This is, this is the problem when we try and make quite, you know, a complicated world binary. It's great for a T-shirt and a sticker for the iPad, but it's not, it doesn't work always that straightforwardly in, in, in leadership situations. As I said, we, we're very careful about, we, we are a member, we've been a member for a long time, but even some of the networks that we're a part of want to do things that we don't think are wise at that particular point in time. Either it's, it's done without any sense of where the world is in its global conversation at that, that time and so forth. It won't land, it won't um, have any traction. You know, just picking out a date and doing things doesn't uh, work. All I'm saying is as a city, we are committed to peace. We are committed to creating a world in which uh, conflict is uh, less likely, um, even in the way we do uh, politics in the city, if I, 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 might, I might suggest that. So, um, no, we, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to you, you know, to have your, uh, some constructive input into what we've been doing on, on the world stage, if you have some um, to offer. Um, but uh, no, we'll, we'll take our, our current approach, which we think is being looked at from cities and, and international bodies around the world and, and being applauded. 
Thank you. We move on to finally on to Conservative Question 7. Councillor Smith, Send Services. Do you have a supplementary? I do. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, supplementary on the second part of the question on engagement with families. I note what you said there about engagement with campaign groups. Um, and I know there are some powerful campaigners in the gallery that we'll no doubt hear from in a moment. But for the hundreds of families that are stuck in the system at the moment, who will have seen the headlines about the Ofsted report and will understandably be concerned and distressed, what steps are we taking at the moment to explain to them um, what's happening and when they can expect to see some changes? Anna, you go and I'll come after you. Sorry, are you all right if I jump in? <laughs> Is that okay? Um, so, the, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And obviously parents and, and carers and their children themselves are obviously critical to getting this right for everybody. Um, the, um, it was, you know, something that's been flagged up before Ofsted as well as, as during, as you know. Um, so, the, a key group um, that all parents and carers of children with SCND are, are all automatically members of as a Bristol parent and carers group. And the chair of that since, or certainly for at least a year, I would say, has sat on our um, leadership board around SEN. So that includes the leads from all the hospital trusts, from the, um, from the local authority. And that was called the partnership board. It's now being the sort of SEND improvement board. So that has a, is a key person on there that represents parents and carers and that, and they, that can be fed into. Um, you know, we will do as much as we can. I respond to every direct request I have for meetings and for um, responses to, to people via email. I can't respond to things on social media. I don't have access, it, access to it all the time. Um, but I do respond to any sort of um, approaches like that. Um, there's been a number of workshops already. There are also ones um, that have been held for SENCOs, who are special educational needs coordinators in schools, who obviously are a key point of contact for parents. Um, and um, that's been really well attended. We've had the best uptake on that, actually, that we've ever had, because this is about obviously getting it right from our point of view as a local authority. But obviously, you also, if you're going through this process, and as you say, many parents will have experienced this here, you will also be dealing with health professionals, um, our children's centres, our early years professionals, um, as well as educational psychologists and a whole range of people and navigating that can be very, very challenging and having being able to have those um, conversations. I've had um, an email today actually from somebody who has had some issues. They've transferred from one local authority to another and there's been some time delays, which lots of parents will be familiar with around their child's EHCP. What I could repeatedly have had is praise for the frontline case workers and actually they are named frequently and I think they're often the people that um, fit, that deal with parents who are really upset understandably on the phone and so on and I do sort of want to take the opportunity to thank them for all that they are doing it'd be really difficult for them reading some some of the judgments which are about strategic organization of send not about necessarily the individuals on the front line and there are um, I had a letter of you know thanks to sent to me from a parent today to thank this particular caseworker, which is really important. Um, the local offer website is key, as it says in the answer, and I think having that as your, your front door there, which councillors, you know, I know you're all aware of, and we need to make sure we're all doing our bit in pointing constituents to that. Um, I'll just add, just add to that, that um, we, we're sharing today, we put an extra 1.3 million into it as part of a, a transformation programme. Uh, you know, you know, in the area. But if I can just make an offer and then ask of you, um, this does happen within the context every time, and it actually has to be prioritised and focused. So this is, no, and again, don't want any mischief. It's no way taken away from that. We've got to put the resources into sorting it out. But there is a context, and the context is that uh, a national review found that the whole funding system around SEN uh, nationally was a system designed to fail. So we do need voices to national government talking about the need for adequate funding for local authorities to take this challenge on. We will prioritise and we'll put the resources in, uh, but we need that national voice. And it's uh, yours is a part of your government. It'd be incredibly helpful if you could meet with Anna and maybe become one of those voices. Do you have a second supplementary? Um, no, thank you. Just, I, I don't actually have Boris on speed dial, but I'll, I'll do my best. Thank you very much. That concludes uh, members' questions. I will now take um, statements received. In terms of the procedure, I would like to remind members of the following. 
A maximum of one minute shall be allowed for the presentation of each statement. There should be no debate on the statement, and I, as the Lord Mayor, shall refer them to the Mayor for consultation. Statements will be dealt with in order of receipt. First statement is received from Councillor Stevens. Democracy Reboot. You have one minute. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I hope you all support the statement, the um, motion this afternoon, Reboot Democracy. Democracy is more than just electing representatives to scrutinise and take decisions. That needs to be supplemented with new approaches. And the two we will talk about this afternoon are examples that have worked elsewhere. Representative democracy was invented hundreds of years ago when the only voters were property owners and businessmen. They needed somebody they could send to Parliament to make sure the taxes didn't go up. Since then, we all have the vote, we're all educated, and most of us agree that legitimacy to rule comes from the people. So we should be thinking about how we expand that legitimacy. You have 10 seconds. Legitimacy. We've had some examples going on. There's no one, an no one answer. We need to try lots. Thank you very engage. much, Councillor Stevens. You had your minute. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to Councillor Thomas, closure of public right of way, Church Steps, BS8. Thanks very much, Lord Mayor. Um, I don't know if you know the, the Mardike steps, um, but like a number of other key pedestrian routes in the city, they've been closed um, and there's no uh, announced date for their reopening because the council is waiting to hear who owns the wall that has closed these steps. These steps are an important public right of way, allowing people from Clifton and Clifton Wood to access the shops and public transport stops on the Hotwell Road. Um, and what I'm really asking is that the council starts to treat pedestrians in the city with the care and respect that they deserve um, and that this public right of way for pedestrians gets fixed as soon as possible and we don't have the same kind of delays that we've had with the King's Western footbridge um, and with the pavement at Redland Hill, both of which have been, were closed or have you been have closed 10 seconds. for over four years. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to Councillor O'Rourke. Changes in parking permits. You have one minute. Thank you. Um, I'm sure you've read the statement. Really, what I want to do is just to highlight that there, there has been a problem with parking permits that was unforeseen. Um, I've had quite a few conversations with officers who are being very reactive and changing things, which is great. Um, there is a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on social media about the desire for paper permits and the confusion over digital permits. So I think really I just wanted to highlight the fact that the communication, I think our, our communication systems perhaps should be changed. I know that you've put out adverts and, and things on the website, but actually it's forums like the next door and stuff like that where people are actually hearing about it. So essentially, I just think that we need to follow up on these assurances that the officers and the cabinet member will consider, can continue to be reactive, make the changes that are necessary for people to go on to you continue have to seconds. have the, um, the standards that they had previously. And I mean, age discrimination is a real issue here. We can't leave ourselves open to that. So um, as long as we have thank you very much, Councillor. I'm sitting down. Thank you. That concludes the statements which we note, and I will refer to the mayor for his information and consideration. Um, we have one whole minute between this meeting and the next, so you can take a breather for one minute.